Welcome back to Safe Space. Um, another episode today. We're talking all things men's mental health um, in the month of November. Go to see Jacaranda FM. We've teamed up with Panda, which has been an incredible app um, partners. We've heard from them during the weeks, and it's just been so nice to have a conversation. Uh, and I'm joined today by Heike Berg, who is um, Igoli in Benelanders, and you've been you've been around the TV scene for us for years. Yeah, it's been um, well. Thanks. It's it's wonderful to be here, and I think it's great what we're doing to share. Um, to uh, to really give hope for, yeah. for men out there because a lot of people are struggling with this kind of stuff. Yeah, um, but the entertainment industry, yeah, sure. I think twenty four years. Some people don't even remember Egoli anymore. <laughs> I mean, you're mentioning Egoli. You know, school kids don't even know what Egoli was or is. But um, yeah, we've been quite blessed, yeah. blessed in the industry. Yeah, um, we've got Graham Roberts with us as well. who's an occupational therapist. Works with the Akeso Group of Clinics and Hospitals and so on. Um, G, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, it was an actually pleasure privilege to come over here. At first, I thought it was just about mental health until they mentioned it was about, it was about men's mental health. Then I was like, damn, let me actually make an appearance then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mm. come through. Let's have this conversation. Sure. Um, I wanted to start. Heike, you've been mm. fairly open. Mm. You wrote a whole book about your journey and your struggles. Um, would you just take us through some of yeah, those? Yeah, so... <coughs> um, I think my journey started, I, I remember when I was in grade two, um, the teacher told my mom that, and I was there, that I was going to end up in jail one day. And, and I'll never forget that feeling when I, uh, apart from the fact that I was so scared that evening, uh, why was I going to end up in jail? What a horrible thing to say uh, to a child. I know, it's terrible. I mean, why would a teacher say that? And, 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 and of course, the power of words has, has got so much, there's so much power in, in, um, in the tongue. I did end up in jail. Um, so she wasn't wrong. But at the time, I remember I was young, and the teachers told my mom, my mom that I suffered from a disciplinary disorder. Now, I don't even know what that was, because at the time, you know, if you were naughty at school, you, uh, you know, I used to go home, and you would get jacked at home as well. It's not like today, where the parents are, are the problem, and, and, and the kid, you know, just gets all the, all the hoo-ha. But um, later on in my life, um, the term today is oppositional defiance disorder, um, which I think, you know, there are, there are various reasons why kids get uh, um, uh, diagnosed with that. I haven't heard the term. <laughs> yeah, ODD. Yeah. yeah, and I think Graham can actually speak. Um, he'll be more technical. You know, it's 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 basically where, I mean, I'm not a psychiatrist or psychologist and stuff, but you you um, you challenge all the social norms and all the social boundaries, and it doesn't come from a place just purely out of rebellion. Be, um, fr- my issue came from a place of not feeling loved not that my parents didn't love me i mean that they loved me dearly and my father loved me dearly but most of these problems come from a place of not feeling worthy and not good enough and broken and rejected and and all of that stuff and not feeling a part of always feeling a part from i yeah. felt very alien in my body and stuff and the way i kind of felt alive coming alive and getting attention from people was to just push these boundaries and and it gets quite chaotic um, and just your normal punishment and everything just used to make that worse. If I so, so I was a, I, a you know at the time you branded as a as a problem child. I remember when I um, had to go to high school, it was a problem because the high schools didn't want to accept me. I was one of those kids that were branded to go to Boys Town. Yeah. And so we had to make a special appearance at the Transvaal Education Department with all the principals. Oh, wow. You know, it was quite a, quite a story. But then eventually my pain translated into the use and abuse of drugs and that obviously amplified all the other mental health challenges. I was a kid that suffered from depression. Um, I don't know whether my bipolar, because I was diagnosed with bipolar, eventually one and then two and then, you know, so with a whole bunch of things. But obviously the drugs did amplify all those those problems. And um, ended up in a few treatment facilities. Graham says, you know, he works for, you know, you're working for Cope, but he's, he's they're also um, one of the contractors for Akiso. Yeah, correct. And Akiso, at the moment, great psychiatric institute. And um, my first treatment facility was a place called Stepping Stones when I was 21, because I ended up being a heroin addict and, you know, it was just, my life was a disaster. And I went to a place called Stepping Stones in Cape Town. And that's the first time that I got clean. But th- that was also the first time that somebody told me that, listen, Aki, you're not a, you're not a bad person. It's, it's, this has got nothing to do with your morals. It's got nothing to do with your willpower. You can't control diarrhea with willpower, you know. <laughs> That's how the disease of addiction works, yeah. you know. You can't try and stop this by yourself that you've got an illness. That was the first time somebody told me that, listen, you've got an illness. There's something actually, you know, and there's, there's, a, there's not really a cure. You can never be cured from addiction, but, but you can arrest it. You can arrest it and live 
uh, a sober and incredible life. Yeah. And that was where I was introduced to the 12 steps. I was introduced to medication for the first time. And we're going to chat a, a little bit about medication and, and that whole, you know, world. So I started my journey. I went to treatment a, a bunch of times. I didn't get clean the first time because mental health and getting clean and all of that stuff is a journey. Yeah. You're going to fall. You're going to relapse. You're going to have failures. And you just get up again. And I've been graced with so much love and people around me that have supported and helped me. But I've also been to Vescopis and to Tara. I've been admitted in psychiatric institutions because of the abuse of things like Ritalin and Concerta, because I was chronic ADHD and because I'm a recovering addict, it's a mood altering substance mm. and recovering addicts can't use Ritalin and Concerta because it's methylphenidate. Methylphenidate is this more or less the same as methamphetamine, which is yeah. thick. And, but there is value to it. I don't want to scare people off. There's a lot of value when they get correctly diagnosed. Absolutely. But a recovering addict, especially somebody like me and you know, I just can't use it. I love the fact that a doctor gave me Ritalin once because he said this, you chronic ADHD, because I am, use it and it's going to change your life. And mm. I took it and it's like my whole life changed. But it was so lacquer that I started drinking <laughs> bottles of this stuff. <laughs> and that took me into a manic phase. And anyway, I wrote my book because I was invited to be on uh, Survivor 2010. And on Survivor, I had an incredible incredible encounter with the Lord, an incredible encounter. And it's important for, for everybody to know that, you know, healing when it comes with mental illness isn't just one thing. It's not just me medicine. It's not just prayer. It's not just your religion. It's not just one thing. It's always a combination of so many things to get to a place of wellness. Yeah. And of course, taking personal responsibility, you've got to decide that, listen, now I want to start living a life of wellness, which yeah. means I've got to take care of my diet, my sleep, my relationships, the stuff that I read, the stuff that I listen to, my, my medicine, being responsible with checking up in my doctors. You know, it's, a, it's an entire, it's so complicated, but it's a whole package that you've got to put together. Yeah. And then I started writing the book and the book was, it did very well. It was a top seller and, and, it, and uh, it's still doing very well today. And then three years ago, I wrote my second book, which was uh, about my mental health, especially ADHD and the problems I had with medication and the other things that I did, because I can't use the traditional medication, the things that I do in order to be able to control it and kind of live gotcha. a life with it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's, such a, it's such a journey yeah. and it's incredible that you've been able to take it on and share it to, mm. want to help other people with it. And Graham, I'm going to come to you because the work you do at Akerso and so on, um, and often with younger people and teens and adolescents and so on, um, I know how utterly terrifying and my family's been through it. I know how utterly terrifying it is when a parent finds out that their kid is on drugs, mm. you know, and now, oh, this is, they must never do it again and we must go to the therapy place right now and I'm going to take you to this place and they're going to sort you out and so on. There must almost always be some sort of mental component that comes with that that also needs to be addressed. Yeah. It's, it's not just as simple as my kid smokes weed. Yeah. You know what I mean? It is actually almost all the time like that. At Akeso, mm. we have this unit called the DDU unit, which stands for dual diagnosis unit. So nobody comes with only an addiction as well. It's always an addiction with a mental illness or trauma or something that's happened in their life. Mm. It's never only just the addiction that we deal with. So it's a, it's a complex thing when you come into the clinic, especially because these are kids that are kind of forced to the facility, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, when you're 14 or 15, you don't have a choice. That's you are just there now, and you think you're there because you smoked that joint that they caught you with. Yeah. But actually, you might need help for other things. So that's one of the biggest problems. And you see it because normally in your stay, you only stay for about three weeks at the clinic. Unfortunately, that's basically what your medical aid will cover. But in the first week, ish, it's just fights on fights, headbutting against headbutting. But after about the second week, once you dig a bit deeper and deeper, you figure out, oh, this is the reason why I may be addicted to substances. It's not just because I want to do it or because it's cool. It's because I'm trying to cope, basically. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I think that's a thing I've, I've seen, you know, I, I know kids who <clears throat> l lost a parent early, lost a parent in high school. And you, you watch how it can affect people and how it can spiral. Mm. And There's a great analogy in AA. They say if you're a drunken horse thief and you take the alcohol away, you're still a horse thief. <laughs> so, so you might as well just drink, you know? Yeah. So just, and it's like Graham says, you know, just putting down the behavior, the drugs or whatever it is, 
doesn't necessarily mean that you are healthy at all. Yeah. You know, you've not only put the, uh, you know, it's, it's, addiction is so interesting. It's, it's really the same illness. It just manifests in different ways, whether it's porn, whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, a gambling or whether it's drugs. It just manifests differently. So when you stop the behavior, <clears throat> you still have the illness. So that's where you need a renewal of the mind transformation and that's where therapy then really really actually starts and and a lot of these programs um you know akiso is great because <clears throat> for example very few people know that an alcoholic which is also most probably a benzo addict which is valiums and rivetrols and urbanols and stuff because usually the alcoholics uses the the benzos to kind of you know stop drinking and whatever and it's for the anxiety but that kind of detox is a very very dangerous detox very very dangerous you can't just for example, a heroin addict cannot, well, I haven't heard of anybody, and if you go read all the material, if you detox from heroin, the chances that you're gonna die is almost nothing, mm. okay, of the detox. But you can die from an alcohol and benzo withdrawal very quickly and you can get a stroke. So it's so important to know for parents and people out there that when you've got an alcoholic and, a, and a, for example, a benzo addict, and of course you've got all the deal diagnosis, is that a Kiso is such a beautiful place to go to because they have to get you medically, they've gotta detox you through it and monitor you and. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> the the thing is, the the more I've spoken to people, and the more I've been on this journey myself, um, you realize that very very seldom it's one thing. Mm. Things sort of lean on themselves um, a lot, and this thing about self medicating. Mm. We've had conversations um, in safe space about you know struggles of financial pressure and struggles of men grappling with the being the provider and all of these stereotypes that our society sort of holds up and that we take out of it and go, if I'm not successful, I'm a failure. If I'm not this, I'm a failure. Um, and then they sort of lean themselves towards addictive behaviors to try and make yourself feel better because we're actually not addressing the underlying thing. And I mean, I think, I imagine, especially in a situation with younger people, yeah. It must be very difficult to explain, not just to them, but also to the parents. Yeah. So I like how you mentioned the men, um, you know, kind of hiding their um, problems. Not exactly what you said, but kind of what I heard. Um, men, for some reason, don't like to seek help for mental illness. Like, it's, it's, it's not a good thing to be depressed or to be sad or to be anything like that. But it's okay to be angry, though. So with all our <laughs> yeah yeah it's okay to it's okay to be yeah exactly so it's okay to be angry so the emotions that's more um, stuck with men is the anger so we don't really cry in front of people or things like that I cry all the time at least which is oh, brilliant right. yeah I, I cry as well yeah. some movies just get to me especially yeah. ones with animals in <laughs> see now I'm just exposing myself <laughs> but it's good but yeah so I'm noticing now there are more men coming to the clinic at least um, when I first started working there there was probably about. 20% men, 80% females. So now this may be about 46, no, 30, 70 at least. Yeah. So it's getting a bit more recognition at least. And we're making some men cry as well, which is great. Yeah. I was going to say, do, do you now have people around you who are more comfortable talking about these kinds of things? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, so it's, it's and, and, and that's one of the things, it's part of your um, process of getting to a place of wellness. And, and recovery, and you're never 100% recovered, ever. I mean, you're always in a place of recovery because there's always another layer of the onion that you can, uh, you know, um, take off. But I've, uh, years ago, we've, I've decided that I want to surround my people, or well, I want to surround myself with people that understand this and love me and understand the brokenness because we, we live in a broken world and everything is broken. Your mind is always also broken, you know? And um, so the people that we hang around with, especially Narcotics Anonymous, you know, when you go into the fellowship or Alcoholics Anonymous, you, the, the idea is, is to share your brokenness all the time. So I got so used to just sharing my brokenness because in the admission of your powerlessness, that is actually where your power lies in. in I was anything going to say, it's, it's a very uh, step, empowering step, step process. one is we admit we're powerless of our addiction mm. or our lives or our people, places and things in our lives that become unmanageable. People think admitting your powerlessness will make you weak. It doesn't. It's putting up the white flag saying, listen, I can't fight this battle alone anymore. I've been trying. It's like getting back into the ring with Mike Tyson for the eighth time thinking, this time I'm going to knock him down. Mm. And it just doesn't work that way. So the moment you admit and you just say, listen, I can't do this thing. It's through that where the empowerment comes because now you're ready to ask for help. Now you're ready. To, now you're kind of at rock bottom and you say the only way back is up. 
Yeah. And I need to I need to ask for a hand. And 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 there are so many people out there that's willing to help. I mean, when I was younger, it wasn't there. It just wasn't there. You just couldn't couldn't go on the internet and just reach out to somebody and get on a meeting or speak to it. It's not there. Today the help is everywhere. Yeah, yeah that's actually a very good point. Um, yeah. I'm just thinking back, you know, to us before social media days, there was literally no one. Yeah. You had that telephone book delivered to your house once a year with everyone's street address in, which is still the most mind blowing. Yeah, everybody's address. And then people freak out when WhatsApp says, Oh, we're gonna know we wanna know what your address is. What? Yeah, you yeah. know, like, no. No. <laughs> Meanwhile they used to publish it yeah. all the time. Um Graham, you're an occupational therapist. Yes. You work with human beings to try and understand themselves and be a bit better Basically. across, you know, a wide range of stuff. What has your experience been of being at a at, at a facility where mental health is prioritized and people? Mm. I mean, is there a recurring theme in what people want to talk about, what they're dealing with? What what's your what's your takeaway? So I've noticed a lot recently, actually let me just speak about the adolescence quickly, mm. if it's all right. So, of course. Um, with this generation of youth, I sound like an old man now, wow. Didn't <laughs> let that happen. <laughs> with this generation of youth, um, mental illness is becoming more of a known, it's become more of a okay thing to have. Mm. So back in the days, I guess, mental illness was seen as like, you know, you're mentally ill, you're crazy, you're sick. Maybe don't seek help because, you know, it's game over for you. So it's becoming more accessible and people are like, much more into it now, if that makes sense. Mm. With the uh, adults, what I've seen is it's not really about their symptoms anymore. It's not really what they present. It's not because they're crying or not going to work or hiding away from things. Um, so we like to use this analogy of a tree. So when you see a tree, you see this massive tree, and that's the symptoms that we see, right? So that's the anger, the sadness, the cutting, if I'm allowed to say, mm. self-mutilation and things like that. But when we give you medication or when the doctors give you medication, you basically chop down that tree. So all the symptoms kind of disappear. So you feel better. But unfortunately, if you leave the tree cut and you leave the roots at the bottom, what's going to happen with the tree? Yeah. It's just going to regrow. So what I like about therapy is that you really try to take out the roots and it hurts. Like it's one of the most painful things ever. You don't want to go live back. You don't want to go back to your trauma that you didn't mm. want to deal with. So now it takes a lot of a lot of guts to come to a therapist and be like, listen, here I am, open me up and like kind of fix me, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And you know what, in life, um, Jerry Dean and I just came from our therapist. And it's a, she's a therapist, she's a, uh, um, I've known her for years, and even though I've been clean for many, many years and things go well and I'm medication free, I used to be on a, do you remember those space, uh, space case? Yeah. Remember the space case? I remember I used to be on a space case full of medication. <laughs> And, and just by grace, thank you. I mean, that I, I'm not I'm medication free today. Yeah. I've been for, for a number of years. And, um, and, but we went and we saw somebody today. Somebody that walks a journey with us because in life, whether it's mental illness or anything else, you need a team of people. You need somebody to be able to point out your blind spots. You need to be able to, somebody to say to you, listen, you're not looking at that. You're not taking accountability. And this mm -hmm. is not where you're taking responsibility. You need to have somebody in your life that will help you through trauma and will help you through things because you can't do life by yourself anyway. So people go and they say, listen, I'm not going to see a, you know, a berater or a psychologist. And I say, dude, that's the best thing you can, you can do is to have somebody to walk a journey with constantly. We've got so many mentors in our life. We've got mentors that are, are financial mentors and, and leadership mentors and, and acting coaches and, and a whole bunch of things yeah. that we personal constantly see. Personal trainers and Yeah, personal trainers and dietitians and, and everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you can have everything, yeah. just not your brain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know? so, just, so just to get to, a, you know... Uh, Human beings are, are fascinating. And when we get past these limiting beliefs, these self-imposed limiting beliefs, especially with mental health, when you fall into depression and anxiety, the kind of blocks, these mental pictures that you build in your head about who you are and what you can achieve and are worthless and, disc you know, you, you become, I, I understand why people get to that place. Mm -hmm. And it's important that you've got somebody because you need people to be able to help you see those blind spots help you back into your living room because you've created this maze in your head and somebody to help you back into your living room to get you back to your true self, to help you understand that you loved and that you were there and that you can see the bigger picture. Because you can't change this. I love this thing. You can't change stinking thinking with stinking thinking. <laughs> I mean, if you've got stinking thinking, when you've got mental health and you're not getting help, you in a place of stinking thinking. So how do you change stinking thinking with your stinking thinking? Yeah. You can't do that. No, you can't. So you need help out there. Yeah. It's absolutely 100 percent true and i think it's such a like i i grapple with the fact that 
and I've said it before, that this thing you've pointed out, that we're allowed to work on our bodies and our bank balances and our skills and our everything, but our emotions should have been fixed from day one. They should always work properly and we should know how to work them. And here's the irony. If, you've got, if, if you're a diabetic and somebody says to you, you've got to use insulin, otherwise you're just not going to make it. You're going to shoot insulin every day. Okay, so people have got no problem with that. Going to the doctor, physically there's something wrong with me, I'm going to get medication. And as he said, sometimes it will fix the symptoms, sometimes it will fix the cause, but you'll be able to get to a place of wellness. Better, you know. But people just don't believe in medication for when it comes to mental health. Yeah. They just think, no, 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 there's a stigma. I'm not going to use an antidepressant, I'm not going to use a mood stabilizer, I'm not going to use this and everything because it's either from the devil or it's from the, or, you know, I'm just not going to use it. But your brain is the most important organ in your body. Yeah. And somehow people don't want to take care of that, but they've got no problem using any other medication. And that's, again, the stigma that we're trying just to overcome. Yeah, it's yeah. exactly that. Um, a lot of the times when we tell our patients um, in one of our groups, listen, guys, the medication that you're on probably is only going to kick in in about six to eight weeks anyway. You're here for three weeks as well. So when you leave, it's not going to be the most, the best that it could be. And they always ask, okay, so am I going to be on this forever? Do I need to take this medication forever? Well, like likely, probably, yeah, but you have to speak to your doctor. Ah, oh, Graham, how can it be? I can't be taking this medication. But what's the difference if you're taking exactly what you're saying, insulin for diabetes or something? Yeah, warfarin for your heart. You it's know. exactly the same thing. I mean, if you stop your medication, chances are you're going to come back worse. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's talk about mental health. Um, and as it relates to to men, you're working in this field. What what does good mental health look like to you? What does good mental health yeah. look like to me? Because you? we always we always only talk about mental health as a as a crisis, mm. as a negative thing. Mm. You know, um, Dr. AJ was saying on one of these sessions that you know it's. It's always when it's in the negative that we talk about it. We never talk about pushing it into the positive. Mm. And what, what does a healthy balance, what does a healthy mind look like to you? Um, I guess I like to use this another analogy well, of this cup that you have, right? So you, Rob, maybe have this cup and it's filled with energy, let's say. And if your cup is about half full, you're about half happy, let's say. But we as human beings, we like to help other people. It's in our nature to help other people. So what do you do with your cup of energy? You must give it to other people until it's empty, empty, empty. I'm speaking with the negatives to start yeah, yeah. with the positives. So now you're left with this empty cup and you still want to help other people, but we never stop there, right? We'll never stop when our cup is empty. We start giving from ourselves, from our own bodies, from our flesh, our soul. And we end up on this floor as like a pile of bones. And this pile of bones can't breathe, eat or anything. It can't help anybody. So to me, a healthy, mentally wise, a healthy person is someone with a full cup, overflowing cup that can feed other people without hurting themselves. So it will be in all fields of family, work, leisure, very important. A lot of the times we put too much um, pressure and time on work, we completely forget about leisure. Yeah. So it's that and then self-care. Those three things mm. for me, work, leisure, self-care is probably health. Mm. <laughs> That's actually a very good way to, to look at it because I think especially as an adult, you're, there's some point in your life where like you're not allowed to have fun anymore. You have mm. to be being productive all the time or you're not being a grown-up. You know? But like play and leisure is important. It's an important part of our mental process. And whether that means you know somebody sits down with their Xbox to play some FIFA or reading a book mm. or painting or going for a run or whatever – Something that's fun, something that you enjoy. Yeah, I, I often ask people like kind of what, what kind of selfless, self-loving activities do you do? And people they kind of look you know, what especially, do you uh, yeah, especially when you ask men that. Yeah. So what what is selfless, self loving? Yeah. It immediately sounds a bit, mm, you know, what is that? <laughs> and uh, and I and you ask people that and I, I suffer from that because I'm a resu results driven guy, I'm goals driven, we've got a few businesses and we work hard and you know, obviously you know, we, we often fall victim to this thing of just working more and growing and making more money and, and all of that stuff. But it's important for Geraldine and I to say, listen, time out. We went to uh, 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 Walkerson's estate in, uh, in Dahlstrom a couple of weeks ago, just for four or five days. We just completely, um, you know, uh, 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 you know, took a break from our daily, yeah. you know, things what we do. But... <coughs> It's a combination of a whole bunch of things, I think, Graham. I mean, your, your soul consists out of your 
um, your emotions, your personality, you know, your your um, your will, your instincts, all of that stuff. So um, I make a conscious decision, conscious decision, and it's something I have to do every single day. I make a conscious decision to read a good book every single day. A good book, something that's going to feed my mind, um, you know, a great leadership book or a mm. book on, you know, that's that's kind of, that's what I do, a book that will feed my mind positive, great things i make a conscious decision to listen to an inspirational motivational or even if it's a sermon whatever every single day i watch who i hang around with even if it's people that doesn't have mental health because if i spend enough time with people that are just you know well, what's that wonderful rule you become the average of the five, the five people, people you that you that spend you spend time spending time with <laughs> and i mean you know it's important that you guard your heart guard your mind um exercise is super important if I start, I realize that late in my life, but it's true. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. Exercise is so important. You know, if you if you suffer from depression, mm. the last thing you want to do is go out and exercise. Okay, that, and but the, the irony is, is if you just get out, walk around the block, take your dogs, go and do four or five k's, and you come back, you're gonna feel fifty percent better. Mm. It's that meme. I'm going for a stupid it's little it, walk. I'm going for a stupid, stupid little walk to feel a <laughs> stupid little bit of dopamine that yeah. I want right now. You know, and eventually when you come back and you go, oh geez, you know, why why, why don't I do this every single yeah. day? Yeah. Yeah. Being like me from the generation where we had telephone How old are you now? no social media, 40. Are you 40? Yeah. I'm 44. How old are you, Graham? Yeah, do I have to say? <laughs> <laughs> I'm 28. Yay! Let's go. Okay. Yeah. Um, growing up when we grew up in the 90s and so on, um, what, what, what were the messages you got around being a man? What was expected of you? Oh, man. Um, men were supposed to play rugby. They were supposed to, to drink and handle their alcohol. I remember that. And obviously, I tried it every single weekend. I could never handle my alcohol because I would end up in the dustbin or somewhere, you know, passed out every weekend. Um, and, uh, you know, if you could uh, grab as many chicks as possible, you know, you would be kind of the guy. And, um, and that was the messages. I mean, it was just quite insane. Yeah. I listened to heavy metal music and death metal and... Um, hung around in, in clubs and everything, but you don't really think about, uh, you know, I'm doing this because I kind of want to be a man. That's just yeah. what you thought was the things that were cool. And 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 it's sad to say that okay, I'm, I'm Afrikaans and I grew up in an Afrikaans church and at the time those churches were very rigid. And I mean, you'd walk into church and all you would feel is just this incredible shame and guilt because everything you do is just sin and wrong and everything and it's judgment. And so I had these conflicting, I wanted to live my life and enjoy my life. I didn't want to do it the way that the church told me how to do it because that was just boring and everything. I didn't find, I didn't meet Jesus on the, the couches of the church. I met Jesus on the island of Survivor. Mm. Okay, it's crazy. And on the floors of Hilbra. That's, yeah. uh, that's, that's where I met my creator, the love that I actually understand, There's this unconditional love from Jesus. There. But... So it was just one big, you were just confused. I mean, I didn't know what it meant to be a, a leader or um, a husband or mm. somebody that's going to be a father one day and everything. We just had to kind of find that out. Just by grace, we're sitting here today and we've paid enough school fees to kind of, you know. <laughs> school of hard knocks. Yeah, school <laughs> of hard knocks. And, and some people didn't make it. Some yeah. people didn't make it. And um, it's so great, great that guys like Craig Wilkinson, Zach Wilkinson, you know, he does all these talks on, on men and um, and w what is true vulnerability with men? And of course, Zayn Mears, which has got this dad ministry going, where he talks, goes around the country and empowers men about what is it, what does it mean to be a real, a real man, a real godly man? And it's incredible to have these examples to follow and to learn from. Yeah. Sure. What about you? What were the messages you internalized growing In up? In my generation of being yeah. 28, um, I would say not so hectic as maybe you guys as well. It's much more relaxed, I guess. Um, there was more of an understanding for men to be who they actually are. I don't know, it's the in-between of the Gen Gen Z, right? No, mm. it's Gen Z and then your guys' generation. Yeah, I don't know <laughs> what we are. <laughs> yeah. So it's just the in-between. I think I was in the um, process of getting to not so much being a man, but being a human being. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because I, same, you, you hear these messages about, you know, the things that are expected of you. And then... I don't find it very impressive anymore when someone wants to talk about something and they get shut down. You know, back in the day, that used mm. to be the standard. Ah, toughen up, you'll be fine. Mm. It'll be okay. 
yeah. you know, lions yeah. don't yeah. cry. Yeah. Or, or, or for example, kids, 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 kids shouldn't be, kids should be seen and not heard. Yeah. You know, those kind of things. Where, yeah. These are not aspirational <laughs> things. These are not normal things. These are not human things. Mm. You know, at the end of the day, we're just a, a ball full of feelings and emotions. Mm. And those should be the most important things we pay attention to. And yet somehow... We're just trying to survive this thing called life. Yeah. One thing I just quickly want to say when it comes to especially mental health and, and addiction, because remember addiction is, a, you know, they, they, they don't really coin the term addiction anymore. It's now substance use disorder or substance mm. induced disorder. Yeah. Okay, so they don't really use the word addiction really that much anymore. Because that sort of locks you in, as you were saying, that the words that lock you in a box, that this is now who you are. Absolutely, absolutely. So they've coined it differently. So substance use disorders, when you use substance induced disorder is something which when you, then you start. Psychosis. Yeah, you know, going on psychosis and of course dual diagnosis with mm. a whole bunch of things online. So um, <clears throat> one thing that I've seen, so I've, I've worked in a lot of treatment facilities and helped and served, try to, you know, make a difference, um, walk the journey with a whole bunch of addicts. And so the other day, uh, uh, a duomini phones me, and he's a very well-respected duomini, and um, him and his wife came and saw me, and we met somewhere at Bazinadia, and he told me his son is an addict and we need to help. Okay, and I said, okay, just tell me a little bit more about it, and his son is, uh, struggles, struggles with depression, and he's bipolar and everything, and you know, but he's an addict, and, and they just don't know what to do. So I said, and how old is your son? And they said, 34. I said, okay, and wh where does he stay? No, he's staying on a flat on their, on their property. I said, okay, um, where does he eat? No, I make food for him. And who does his washing? Well, I still do the washing for him. And I started, and as this conversation started, you know, I, at, at one point, there was a whole bunch of things that they shared, but one time I just stopped them and I said, do you realize that you've got 100% responsibility in your son's addiction? And I said, why? I'm taking care of my son. I said, you're not taking care of your son. You're enabling your son. And the biggest killer of addicts, alcoholics, and, and addicts, and, uh, uh, you know, mental health patients is the biggest killer of them all is enabling parents and spouses which i've realized and especially in today's generation where parents where they think they help but they just enable and there's a huge difference between between the two like because parents are like but how do i help my son and because every time you know the car gets stolen they buy another car every time something goes missing from the garage they just purchase something they just put it back you know they and the discipline and the the tough love isn't there. And a lot of people don't agree with tough love, but tough love is still love nonetheless. Yeah. So what happens is, is the parents and the partners, instead of helping this person, they enable this person, first, but they don't know what the difference is. So there's a huge gap you in the think market. You're helping. You think you're helping, but you're just enabling that person further along the road. That, that guy that's 34 years old, he should have been out of the house long ago. The parents should have stopped making food and washing his dishes and washing his clothing years ago. Okay, but the, because she feels sorry for my son and maybe if he's going to go on the street, he's going to commit suicide and oh, he's going to die. So I'm just kind of take care of my son. And, and that's what is called enabling. And I think there's a huge and I'm not saying it's easy. I'm, I've got a little baby girl that's going to be born now and we're going to sit with a whole bunch of stuff and I'm going to have to learn how to be a father and practice tough love. But so I'm not saying it's, it's easy, but there's a huge gap in the market when it comes to education and teaching parents and partners the tools on how do I really help this guy? Because sometimes you're going to help a person a lot more by putting down a boundary and saying no than saying yes. Yeah. And you I know? think you make a very good point. And as part of these discussions, one that I'm looking forward to having at some point is a discussion around communication. Mm. Um, because communication is, is such an important part of how we can speak about our own and how health. do you communicate without blaming exactly. without taking responsibility for like how do you do that stuff how and do i say something that, that i know you hear me yeah, exactly that you're not you it's not going in your ears but you yeah. think i'm saying something else how do we know we're yeah. on the same page and, and for example when there's conflict conflict is is is, is, is wonderful it's healthy but mm. how do i have conflict what are the rules when we go into the ring together what are the, yeah. rules? What are the rules we can have an argument and there can be conflict but there should be rules and if you overstep the line then i'm not going to engage yeah. anymore mm. And, and how, do you, how do you get both parties to learn that communication skills? Yeah. At the same time, if, you, if they overstep your line, you can't also just avoid the situation. You have to come back to the arguments anyway. You can't just leave it up in the yeah. air like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, it just brings up anger and hate. Yeah. Funny enough, we end that week at a kissel relationship week. <laughs> so come through. <laughs> yeah, but, but I want to say this. There's so much. I want to say to the listeners and stuff. There's so much hope out there. You can live an extraordinary life. And whatever it is that you're going through at the moment, it is seasonal. It's always a season. You're never going to be in this hole forever. Yeah. And things might change. Medication might change. Help might change. You might want to be medication-free. You know, there's a, 
this is an absolute journey and just because you're feeling like you're feeling right now doesn't mean that there's not a life of abundance awaiting you. Yeah, you know? as I realize, yeah, my own journey and all the stuff that's happened as well was uh, the, the one thing I've taken away is that nothing is static. Yeah. Nothing, the way things are now are not going to be the way they are forever. Yeah. And that's an absolute certainty. Yeah. Um, gentlemen, yeah. thank you so much for your time. I really thank appreciate you, it. Thank you. Graham, thank you Graham you're a superstar, hey, man. Thank oh, you too, man. <laughs> hey, you're a champion. <laughs> I'm going to come visit you. You must come. You know where we are. Where, um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rob. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. I sure. appreciate it. Thank you. Jacaranda FM.